Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. Most certainly appreciate your presence. May the Lord bless you. How would you praise God for a beautiful day in which we can worship the Lord in? And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up, we can be an inspiration to you. And you in the radio listen audience would do someone a favor. You just get on that phone and call them and tell them to tune in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour and get the hour coming up. If you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn to two places in the Word of God. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 12 and John chapter 19. Now, while you're turning to these places in the Bible, let me say just a word to the radio listen audience. You here in the auditorium, bear with me as I do so. You in the radio listen audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you tune into the station where you're now listening. You can get our daily broadcast at 12 o'clock noon each day, Monday through Saturday. And then if you haven't written in for a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour for March of next year, now is the time to get your name on the list. You may say, now, Preacher Edwards, that's about four or five months away yet. I know that, but you have to get your name on the list because our agency has to know, have some idea about how many is going to make provisions for the trip. And we do have one of the greatest trips lined up this time I think we've ever had. I've been there 10 times, and this is one of the greatest of all. We plan to go to Jordan, and then from Jordan, we'll be going over into Israel. In the land of Israel, we'll take a ride on the Sea of Galilee. And then we'll go to Mount Calvary, where Jesus was crucified. We'll go to the garden tomb, where he uh, rose again from the dead. We'll go to the upper room, where Jesus met with the disciples for the Lord's Supper and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then we'll visit David's tomb. We'll visit the tomb of Lazarus. We'll be going down to the Dead Sea and visit the Dead Sea, of course. And then we're going to Masada. Now, Masada is the place where the Jews held out for some three years after 70 AD and then committed suicide rather than to be conquered by the Roman Legion. And then we're going to Petra, the beautiful rose rock city of Petra. You get into the city on horseback. And then when you get on the inside, you'll find, I see, a beautiful city carved out of rock. It's beautiful rose color, a wonderful scene. It's the place where the Jews will be driven during the tribulation period from the Antichrist. If you've never seen Petra, you ought to see the rock city of Petra. And so these things will have lined up, and then after leaving Jordan, we'll go to Greece, and visit some wonderful places in Greece, where Paul preached his Mars Hill sermon and other places, and then leaving Greece, we'll be coming back home. be a 10-day tour, and if you'd like to have a brochure on the trip, write to me or call me. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is a zip code number. You write to me today and I appreciate it. This is a faith ministry. The radio ministry is a faith ministry. And I look to you the love God to work with me in getting out the gospel. You pray for me and write to me next week. That mailing address once again is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, the zip code number. I'd like to hear from you. It'll mean a lot to me. We're workers together in getting out the gospel. Received a letter last week from a man that goes up into the mountains on during the summer and back down to Florida in the winter time. And he wrote me from Florida. He'd gone back down for the winter. And he said, Preach Edwards, I deeply appreciate your ministry. I'm glad we have a preacher that endeavors to feed the saints. And he enjoyed the uh, several weeks we were preaching on Joseph being a type of Jesus. He enjoyed that tremendously. He said it was food for the saints of God, and I appreciated that. And so if you appreciate our ministry, we'd like to hear from you. Now remember, the Sunday morning broadcast is taped. It's on cassette tape. 
And the tape's available, both the singing and the message on cassette tape. If you'd like to have the tape, we've been taping our Sunday morning program for a long, long time. We have quite a few tape on our Sunday morning broadcast. If you'd like to have the one today, a one that we've brought in the past, then you write in and request it and enclose a gift of $5 or more to help pay for radio time and we'll get the tape read out to you. Now the tape today, the message today will be on tape and it will be available. Now I'm going to speak today on a very unique subject. I'm going to speak on the subject, what is worse than going to hell? I'm going to show you from the Bible that some things worse than going to hell. And before you pass your opinion, just give me time to bring the message. And then you'll agree with me, I'm sure, 100%. Luke chapter 12, I want to begin reading with verse 42. It's page 1093 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward? Whom his Lord shall make rule over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season. Blessed is the servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. But if that servant sin his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to beat them in servants and maidens and eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him. In an hour when he is not aware, I will cut him in sunder, and will appoint his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant which kneweth his Lord's will, or knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Now I want you to keep that verse 47 in mind. The person that knew the will of God and didn't do it shall be beaten with many stripes. Now in John chapter 19 and verse 11, I want to read one verse of scriptures, verse 11. John chapter 19, page 1142, verse 11. Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given to thee, or given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivereth me unto thee hath the greatest sin. Now notice he said, hath the greatest sin. Now, what is meant by all of this? What is worse? What is greater than going to hell? What is worse than going to hell? I'm not taking anything today from hell. I want you to know that. Hell's established fact. Jesus created hell. And the hell was made for the devil and his angels. And sinners go there because they reject Jesus Christ. But there's something far worse than just merely going to hell. Now, I want to tell you what it is. Number one. It's those that die lost in great light. Now it would be far better for people that die in the jungles of Africa and go to hell that's never had the gospel like we've had it here in America than to be a sinner and die and go to hell out of an enlightened land, spiritually speaking, like America. The Bible plainly tells us those that die in great light is going to receive greater punishment. Now, there is a degree of punishment in hell. I want you to know that. I'll prove that from the Bible. There are degrees of punishment in hell as we see from the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 15, Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah is that reject the apostles and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, be better for them. Now, in Mark chapter 6 and verse 11, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when you depart, then shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now these scriptures let us know that these cities that rejected Jesus Christ and rejected the gospel in his day, their punishment will be greater in the day of judgment than the city of Sodom, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We find in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29 these words, How much so of punishment suppose ye shall be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, whereof he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. He said, How much sore punishment shall these receive that's trampled underfoot the blood of the Son of God? In John chapter 3 and verse 19, 
The Bible said, and this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And of course, men love darkness rather than light. So according to the Bible, those that die and go to hell from a land of great light will be punished greater or more than those that die out of the heathen jungles that haven't had the light of the gospel like we've had it here in America. Now you keep that in mind. Now we move to thought number two, and that is those with evil deeds and evil works will be punished more than the good moral people that die and go to hell. They'll be punished with greater punishment according to the Bible. Now it's hell to go to hell. It's awful to go to hell. Hell is a terrible place. But the more wicked you are, greater will be your punishment if you die without God. Somebody said, well, I'm a sinner. I'm going to hell. I might as well get drunk and curse and gamble and kill and commit all the sins I want to and enjoy. I'm going to hell anyway. You better beware. You better wake up. The greater your sins, the more wicked you are, greater will be your punishment. Do you think a holy and just God will punish a good moral mother that never knew what it was to go out and engage in sin and, and yet she died without receiving Jesus Christ? And live the good, clean, moral life all of her days on the earth. Mothers, many of them do that. Do you think she's going to be punished as much as Adolf Hitler? Absolutely not. Hitler would be punished far more than this good moral mother that goes to heaven just because she failed to accept Jesus Christ as her Savior, according to the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 14, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Jesus said these religious people in his day that went out and took the advantage of widows and offerings and went out and devoured widows' houses, he said your punishment will be greater. Your damnation will be greater. Hell will be hot for these religious people today that deceive humanity and fail to give them the truth and fail to give them the true gospel and deceive them and take of them from them gifts and offerings and lead them on to hell. Hell will be hot for these people according to the Bible. In Revelation chapter 20 verses 12 through 15, I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books open and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things, notice that plural, those things which were written in the books, plural, according to their works. The Bible said, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell lived of the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And who said was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now did you get these verses? The Bible says there's a record being kept. Every sin a sinner commits is put down in that book. And when he comes, the great white throne judgment of God, he'll be judged and received from God Almighty his degree of punishment according to his wicked deeds upon the earth. Now just as certain as a Christian is judged for his rewards, a sinner will be judged for his degree of punishment in hell. That doesn't shorten the time. Hell is forever. If a man dies and goes to hell, he goes there forever. He goes to the lake of fire forever. But there's a degree of punishment, and some's going to be punished far worse than others. And people that are living for the devil, all the sins they're committing, beloved, when they stand before God at the great white throne judgment as a sinner, there they're going to be judged out of those books. What would be the need of a judgment? And what would be the need of a record at the great white throne judgment of God if there were not degrees of punishment? That would be a mockery. There'd be no need of a judgment. No need of a record. When sinners leave the bounds of this earth where hell is now and transferred before the great white throne at the end of the millennium, they'll stand before a holy God and those books will be opened. And the sinners will be judged from those books according to their wicked deeds. Now people need to get saved, need to get born again. They need to come to know Christ. But it would be far better to be a good, moral, clean, honest, upright person and die and go to hell than it would be to be an awful, wicked, cursing, 
murderous sinner and die and go to hell according to the Bible. God's not keeping these books for nothing. And the judgment would be there for a purpose. And it would be a mockery to have a judgment for sinners if there were not degrees of punishment. And there will be degrees of punishment for that sinner in the place called the lake of fire according to the Bible. Number three, those that knew the Lord's will and did it not. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12 and verse 47, And that servant which knew his Lord's will, and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. Here is a person that knew the Lord's will for his life. He refused to come to God to get right with God. And the Bible said since he knew it and did nothing about it, he'll be beaten with more stripes than others according to the Bible. See, you have people today that are sinning against God in light. They know they ought to get saved. They turn down Jesus Christ. They reject the gospel. They'll be beaten with more stripes if they die without God than the sinner that hasn't had the chance to do that. Some people got saved the first time they ever heard the gospel. The late evangelist Hyman Alpman many years ago, greatly used of God, went on to be with the Lord a few months ago. He was a Jewish evangelist. And he said the first time he ever heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, he gladly gave his heart to the Lord. There's a lot of people that's heard it over and over again, and hell will be far worse for them if they die without God. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, the Bible said it had been better for them had they not known the way of righteousness than after they had known it to turn from the holy commandments delivered unto them. So a person that knows the way, that is, he knows what he ought to do about getting saved. He knows he should come to God. And then he goes on and dies without God. Hell is going to be harder for him than the person that didn't have the opportunity time and time again like he had according to the Bible. Then we move to thought number four, and that is, hell is going to be hot for the rich that oppress the poor. Now today we have in America more millionaires than the world has ever known. You'd be surprised how many millionaires has become millionaires since World War II. Now there's nothing wrong in being wealthy, providing you get it honest, and providing you give God His part, and providing you consider the poor and those in need. But you have wealthy people today, they'll trample you down and walk on you to get another dollar without considering the poor, without considering God or anybody else. In James chapter 5 and the first four verses, the Bible says, Go to now you rich men, weep and howl, for your ministers that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth eaten. Your gold and silver is cackered and the rest of them shall be a witness against you. And shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold, the high of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which of you have kept back by fraud, crieth, and the cries of them which reapeth are entered into the ears of the Lord. Now, what is God saying? What is Brother James telling us? James is telling us in the end time, there'll be rich people in the world that will oppress the poor to get far more riches, not considering the suffering the agony, the heartaches that poor people go through, they don't care about that. They want big salaries. They want big retirement funds. I was reading the other day where the top man in the Senate today, when he retires, he's going to get about a million and a third dollars as retirement. And his name is Ted Kennedy. When Ted Kennedy retires, an ultra-liberal, he's going to get a million and a third dollars dollars as a retirement fund when he retires. Not only him, but a few other citizens are going to get a million dollars or more, and others are going to get close to a million. I understand today when the judges retire, like Supreme Court judges and others, when they retire, if they're making a seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars a year, they'll make even more than that in retirement. Now you have people that are today that's feathering their own nest. There are politicians that get into power and they're concerned about feathering their own nest, getting their own salaries raised, living in luxury and having a great income when they retire. And they're not concerned about poor, suffering people that can hardly make ends meet, 
that can hardly pay their rent, that can barely buy enough groceries to get by. They're not concerned about them. They're concerned about making another million. And they make it rough on poor people many times. And that crowd, hell is going to be hotter for them, according to the Bible, than the poor man that dies, a broke person without any money. In Malachi chapter 3 and verse 5, I will come near to you, to you in judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against the false swearers, against those who press the hiring in his wages. The widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the strangers from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. God said, I'm going to bring swift judgment upon these. You have a lot of pencil brains today. They attend uh, colleges and universities, and I'm not going to criticize them for that. But to learn how to do the job, they think, and to go into these plants in various places with a pencil behind their ear, and they'll sit down and figure out how they can cause that person to have to uh, get more production or else um, uh, somebody will take his job. They'll try to figure out how they can cut out a few men here and put more on somebody else, let them do their job. They're concerned about standing in good with their company because it looks good to them. And they're unconcerned about the poor man and woman that's oppressed out there, trying to get production, trying to run his job, trying to make a living. Got a wife and youngest to feed back home. And he knows if he doesn't get production, then he'll be laid off. A younger man will get his job or somebody will take it over. And the poor man and the poor woman stands there many times with tears running down their cheeks, trying to get production, trying to make a living when they have more on them than they can hardly produce to save their necks. And you have these pencil brains sitting in the office figuring all of it out, putting greater burdens upon the poor. And there's a God in heaven that's looking down on these people and hell will be hot for them when they face God in the judgment. Now you better be careful how you oppress working people. Better be careful how you overload them, how you require them production that they can hardly reach when they have a family to feed and bills to pay. And you oppress them and put more and more on them. As they grow older, they can't do quite as much, and yet you require them to do even more. You go in the face of holy God in the day of judgment, and hell will be hot for you if you don't get right with God and do something about it. The Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, as two people died, a rich man and a poor man. The rich man went to hell, the poor man went to heaven. The rich man didn't try to help the poor man when he's alive, but when he opened his eyes in hell, he begged for the poor man to help him. Just to bring a drop of water and put it on his tongue. God said, nothing doing. Nothing doing. In your lifetime, you wouldn't help the poor. No need to call for them now. And because people are wealthy, and don't misunderstand me, nothing wrong in being wealthy. If you're honest, you get your money honest, you give God his part, and you consider your, the poor and your neighbors and widows and orphans and so forth. If you get wealthy that way like Abraham of old, and consider these things well and good, the more money you have, the more you ought to be able to do for God and your church. But beloved, you have people today that's hoarding up every dollar they can. If they get one million, they can't hardly wait to get another. If they cram their ticket into the bank, they can't wait next week to cram another one in without any consideration for anybody but themselves. They deprive themselves of things that they need and rob themselves of doing things for God they could do to the glory of God. And that is bad. And when you oppress the poor and make it hard on the poor, God is sitting in heaven. You need to be careful about how you abuse a widows and orphan children and poor people that can hardly make a living. And you take the advantage of them because you have the opportunity to do so. You will face God in the judgment and hell will be hot for you according to this Bible. Let's move on to another thought and that is those in authority. You have a lot of people today in the seat of authority. You have the presidents, you have senators, you have congressmen, you have governors, you have mayors, you have sheriffs, you have policemen. You have people in the seat of authority today. Every man that's elected by the people are placed in a place of authority. He's not only going to give an account unto God for his soul when he dies. He's going to give an account unto God for the way he exercised his authority while he was in office. For instance, let's talk about the mayor. If the mayor of a city has the right to keep out uh, evil in that city and he don't do so and he, has, he can do it, he won't do it, he'll answer God for that in the day of judgment. Beloved, the governor, if the governor has the power to do away with evil, to keep evil out of the, the state and he doesn't do so, he encourages evil, 
not only give an account unto God in the day of judgment for his soul, but he's going to answer God been governor of the state in which he was governor. When people elected to office in America, they shouldn't take it lightly because they got a God in heaven that's watching every move they make. And if they can do good and help in the way of cleaning up the city and getting rid of evil, then well and good. But if they can do it and don't do it, they can't pass the buck and pass that responsibility on to somebody else. They going to answer to God for it in the day of judgment. The Bible says in Luke chapter 12 and verse 48, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. Romans chapter 13 and verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the power of powers, for there is no power but of God, the power that be ordained of God. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2 verses 2, uh, 13 and 14, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of men, for the Lord's sake, whether it be the kings and supreme or governors, as unto them that are sent for the punishment of evil doers, and for the praise of them that do well. Now we have a terrible, rotten, corrupt, criminal judicial system in America today. The liberals, the Earl One Supreme Court just about wrecked this nation. Now the ACLU is taking up where they left off. And one of the biggest curses in the land today is the ACLU organization. They'll be meeting here in Athens Thursday according to the paper today and they're going to talk about and discuss the matter of abolishing capital punishment in the state of Georgia. That's a direct sin against God. That's a sin act against true Americanism. The ACLU is a pro-crime organization. It's rotten. It's full of liberals. It's one of the greatest enemies we have in the land today. And if you don't like it, you can leap it, lump it, leave it, or jump over to whatever you want to do. I'm telling you the truth anyhow. They're trying to abolish capital punishment in the state of Georgia. That'd be one of the greatest things, uh, the, one of the worst things that ever happened in Georgia or any other place. Out in Texas last week, they tried a man that bragged about the fact that he had murdered 165 people in America. Now you let that sink in and smoke that in your pipe for a few minutes. This man bragged about the fact that he had murdered 165 people in America. He's 47 years old. He murdered, I believe, seven in Texas. And they were trying him for murdering his teenage wife with a butcher knife. They tried him. And you know what they did for him? They sentenced him to what they call life. They asked him, they said, what do you think about that sentence? He grinned like a horse eating brides, and he said, that's what I expected. Now, there's a man having killed 165, according to what he said, and they tried him and gave him life in prison. Before he dies, he'll probably kill somebody else in prison because he likes to do that. Now, the judge, the jury, whoever's responsible for giving him life in prison instead of going out and, and breaking his neck, every crime he commits from here on in, they're going to answer God for it. Whenever a man is tried for cold-blooded murder, the Bible says he ought to be put to death. And if he's sentenced to die and he's not put to death, they seal you and the rest of that gang of liberals and all the rest of them that's fighting against God and fighting against the Bible and fighting against true Americanism. Every crime that that person commits, they go and ask God for it. That judge turns the man loose. He's committed cold-blooded murder. He's sentenced to death. The judge reduces it to uh, maybe life in prison. He goes to prison and he kills somebody. That judge will answer to God for that murder. That, ju that jury, those lawyers will do it. Beloved, those that started will answer to God for it. And these ACLU is going to have the blood of many of innocent persons that's been murdered on them when they face God in the judgment. I'd rather join the Q Club Klan outfit than to be a member of that liberal outfit and have to face God in the judgment. And I'm not going to join either one of them. Beloved, you listen to me. We have a dangerous organization in this land that's working against the good of this country, and you better beware of it, whether you like what I say or not. They're going to face God in the judgment. We need to do something about crime in America. Innocent people are dying every day. That's because we're letting criminals loose and not doing what God said in this book. The Word of God plainly said, if a man commits cold-blooded murder, his punishment is he's to be put to death. And if he's not put to death, somebody has fallen down on the job and somebody will answer God for it. That's never been changed. God put that in the Bible in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6 and other scriptures in the Bible. It's never been changed. God don't intend for it to be changed. Now the ACLU and other groups are thinking no more than God. Got there, they come in. It's a judgment bar of God. And they'll answer God for their crooked ways and the way they've encouraged crime in America. Now let's move to another thought. 
Here's something else that's worse than just merely going to hell, and that is when you get there to think about your lost loved ones on the way. That's worse than just going to hell. In Luke chapter 16, verse 28, If I have five brethren, you may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. You die and go to hell as a sinner, that's bad enough. What's going to make it worse is to know you got children that's about to tumble in with you. Knowing you got brothers and sisters that's coming to hell. Go there and meet your mother and daddy there. That's worse than just going to hell. And there's many of a dad and mother in hell today that's wondering and afraid just any minute that their children will die and fall into hell where they are. And the rich man said, oh, if somebody would go back and warn my brothers. And you die and go to hell and have to worry about your lost loved ones on the earth. It's going to be worse than just going to hell. And then finally the terrible society and insanity of hell is going to be worse than just barely going there. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9 and verse 3, And madness is in their heart while they live and after they go to the dead. Hell is a madhouse. Madness in their hearts. The Bible says in Revelation 21 8, but the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the adults, all lies, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 15. For without a dog and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters, and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. That's the society. That's the crowd that you'll have to live with forever. Who wants to go to hell and be there among the curses? and the murderers, and the Hitlers, and the Joe Stalins, and the crooks of this world. Who wants to go there? That's the dumping ground of the universe. That's the scum of the earth in hell. Who wants to go there and be with that crowd forever? If you could go to hell and be there by yourself, you'd be better off. But you can't do that. You go and you go, if you go to hell, you'll go there and live forever among the worst that's ever born on this earth. The greatest people that ever walked on this earth are Christian people that go to heaven when they die. And if you go to heaven when you die, you'll be among the greatest society, the greatest people that ever live. But if you die and go to hell, it will be far worse to go there and have to look that crowd in the face than it would be if you just merely went to hell and nobody there but you. Somebody said, well, if I go to hell, I won't be by myself. You better think that through. You might would to God you were there by yourself when your youngins get through cursing you and fighting you in hell for not telling them about Jesus and win them to God. Beloved, hell is an awful place. And if you die and go to hell, your record is going to face you at the judgment bar of God. And God's going to sentence you your degree of punishment in hell. It's far worse to go to hell as what I mentioned this morning. Facing these things I mentioned, and just merely die and go to hell. You may say, Preacher Edwards, I'd like to be saved. What can I do? I don't want to go to hell. If you get saved, your evil record from the time you were born in this world until you get saved... God blots it out. The blood of Jesus Christ blots it out and you start a new record the moment you're born again. The record you'll face as a Christian will be at the judgment seat of Christ from the time you're born again until God calls you home. But if you die a sinner, every sin you've ever committed from the time you came to this world until you die, you're going to face it at the judgment bar of God. Give an account for it. And God's going to met out your degree of punishment in that awful place called hell. I want to give you this story in closing. Back in the close of the Civil War, yonder at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, there stood a dear man and woman, and they saw the soldiers coming back after the war, some of them ragged, some emaciated, some muddy, some a long beard, long hair, some crippled, all trying to make it back home, some going north, some going south. This young couple stood there in their home and watched those dear men there as they walked along in the mud, and some of them could hardly walk trying to get back home, the war had ended. They saw one man, long beard, long hair, hobbling along, clothes torn and ragged. They saw he had a piece of paper, and he would look at that paper, and he'd look at the house, and then he'd move on to the other, and move on to the other. Now this couple stood there because their son wouldn't be coming home. He was killed in the Battle of Bull's Run there in the Civil War. The only son they had. But they watched those other soldiers and finally they watched this young man. He came to every house. Finally he came to their house. He looked up at the number. He looked at the paper. And then he knocked on the door. The couple came to the door and they said, uh, Young man, something we do for you? He said, Yes, sir. To Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so live here. They said, Yes, we do. And he had the paper in his hand. It was muddy, but they recognized the handwriting. It was a handwriting of their own son. And he said, I have a message for you. 
And he gave them the paper and they read it. On that paper, their son said, Dear mother and daddy, I'll never make it back. This man that's bringing this message, I stepped between him and the enemy, and the enemy fired, and I was shot, but I won't live. And this man has no mother, and he has no daddy, and he has no home. I want you to please take him into your home in my place and let him be your son. They both grabbed this young man in spite of his long beard and his ragged clothes and his muddy feet. They hugged him and they kissed him. They said, son, son, you're our son now. This is your home. That's what Jesus does for us. We come to God, muddy feet, torn clothes, ragged, sinners, wicked, and we trust Jesus our Savior. And God forgives us for all of our sins and takes us in and says, you're my son now and you're my daughter and you're mine forever. If you're not saved, you ought to get saved today. Let's stand to our feet. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today in Jesus' name that you use the message that you speak to the radio listed audience that somebody might be saved today. Father, I pray you speak to everyone in this building that somebody here that's not saved. May this be the time they'll get right with thee. Someone backslidden, may they come home. God, someone want to join the church, may they move forward. May Jesus be honored during this invitation. We pray in his name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us as she plays on the instrument. If you're in this building unsaved, backslidden, you want to join this church where we receive members, you want to come forward for any reason, you may do so. While we wait, would you come? The invitation extended to you, would you obey God, would you come? You and you alone know whether or not God is speaking to your heart. If I didn't know the Lord, I wouldn't leave here unsaved. If you're out of fellowship with God, you ought to come back into fellowship with the Lord today.